We're just going to jump right into the text this morning. Uh, we'll kind of hit a couple of review points uh, along the way. We're in 1 John, of course. We've been working our way through the verse of 1 John. And I think this may be the slowest I've ever worked my way through a book before. Uh, but there are just so many things that just jump out to me in 1 John that we absolutely must discuss. Um, and we've already gone back a couple of times to hit some things that we had hit. We wanted to hit them harder and from a different angle to give you a better understanding of them. And I really just had so much enjoyment as I've studied the book of 1 John. Uh, it's just been amazing. That's why I have to calm myself down because I'm so excited to tell you these things that I've found here in 1 John. Um, so we'll start 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to start reading 1 through 6. And we'll work our way through the text a little bit more as we go on. <clears throat> John says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And this is where we're going to be uh, picking up. Um, we've talked about verses 1 and 2 very much in depth. We're going to be picking up with three through the rest. So, and hereby we do know that we know him. How's that, John? How do we know that we know him? If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we know that we know that we are in him. How do we know we're in him? He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk, even so as he walked. So in this set of verses, we're going to get through three different tests this morning, three different ways that John qualifies how you know that you know him, three different ways that John attacks the false teachers at the same time as giving those who know him, know him confidence. We began looking into these verses before, and as we look into it again, we spent a great deal of time talking about propitiation. And one last time, if you have not caught that propitiation lesson, please jump to our website or catch it on the YouTube. And we'd also been, we also, in our last lesson, looked into the idea of keeping his commandments. Um, and we're going to look into that just a little bit more this morning. John says, hereby we know that we know him. Again, when John does this, he's attacking the false doctrines and false teachers who claim to know God. Those Gnostics who claim to have that gnosis, that special knowledge, that complete knowledge of God that nobody else can have unless you're one of them. He's attacking them. He's attacking them because the actions that they put forth, the things they said, I know him, but then their life didn't match up with knowing him. They said, I know him, but then they didn't follow his teachings. The idea of, of knowing here um, is not some sort of distant knowledge. It's not a third-hand knowledge, so to speak. It's not a knowledge based on someone else's experience or opinion. In other words, you don't get to say that you know Jesus because your grandma knew Jesus. You don't get to say that you know Jesus because you go to a church where other people know Jesus. That's not what John is talking about. And we talked about in the beginning how John says, I saw him, I looked upon him, I beheld him, I touched him, I groped him the word of life, and how he was talking about how that Jesus is so very real. But as we today are so very far removed from that situation that John was, none of us can say that we've seen him, we've beheld him, or we've touched him. But we can have a relationship with him that is as real to us as the relationship was for John. John here uses the idea of keeping something. The idea of keeping something means to watch out for or to guard. But it's not to guard as in the sense of guarding a prisoner, something that you're worried about escaping. It's the idea of to watch or to guard as in to keep something precious to you. And when we think of the idea if somebody gave you something precious, Adam, if I gave you something precious, something that was important, I said, Adam, this is important, I need you to protect this. There are a couple of different ways that you might go about doing that. You might go put it in a safe somewhere, and, and that precious thing might be protected there in the safe, or, and it might collect dust. But... If it were really, 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 really important, really important, really important, you would never let the thing out of your sight. You would keep the thing with you. You would keep the thing attached to you. Hopefully, it would be something small enough to slip in your pocket, <laughs> not a truck, right? <laughs> you would keep that thing with you. You would keep that thing close to you. You would keep that thing where you could see that thing and know that thing, and, and you would protect that thing. And that's the idea about keeping his commandments. It's not something that we, we, we keep it safe, we put it in a safe, and we walk away from it and we leave it there but it's about something that's so very important to us that we want to keep our eyes on it the whole time we want to see it 
And that, in turn, then applies to our relationship with Christ. It's something that should be so very important to us. We don't just have a relationship with Christ one day and then put it, on, put it in that safe the next and walk away from it. We want to have that ever in front of our eyes and ever close to us. It should be important to us. This gives us a little bit of a different view of the commandments. Again, as we talked about before, not as an obligation, but something that's precious to us. Something that ought not be a burden to us, but something precious. When we keep them, the idea as well of keeping something contains with the idea of obedience. If you keep them, you guard them. If they're precious to you, then I'd like to think that you would obey them as well. And when we talk about obeying, um, especially when we talk to children, we, we tell them that true obedience requires three things. True obedience requires three things. It requires immediacy. In other words, when you tell them to do something, you want them to do it now. Not like three minutes from now, not five minutes from now, not a day from now. When you tell them to do something, you want them to, to, to execute now. I want you to clean your room. I want you to clean your room tomorrow. I want you to clean your room today, okay? <clears throat> we, we expect when we talk about obedience and we tell our children to obey us, that they'll obey us completely. Say, I want you to clean your room. It doesn't just mean the first half of your room that's easy to clean. It means underneath the bed and actually clean your room. We expect them to obey completely. We also expect them to obey with a good attitude attitude and we've all seen a child or maybe even our coworker, who when given an order carries it out with a bad attitude complaining whining and murmuring the whole time the same applies when we have an opportunity to obey god's commandments how many times has pastor davis preached something on a sunday morning and you're convicted you're actually convicted i'm not talking about you just have an emotional assent i mean you're actually convicted you actually feel in your heart i want to change something in my life i want to do something different maybe even come down to the island you pray about it maybe you pray at your seat maybe you just say to yourself self we're gonna do something different but then monday monday morning comes around and you've forgotten about it that's the last thing on your list because you did not do that thing with immediacy you did not do that thing as if it were important to you you didn't do that thing as if it were precious to you you did that thing not at all you did it in your mind, and that's where it stopped. How many times are you reading God's Word, and God tells you to do something, and you put it off? You don't do it. You forget about it. You know why we teach our kids to obey right away? And I think this is, this is important, too. We teach our kids to obey right away. We teach our kids to listen for our voice. Because the Holy Spirit, we know, speaks in a still, small voice. And sometimes, the Holy Spirit that's speaking in a still, small voice only says it once. So if we're not paying attention, we miss it. If we're not paying attention, we might not get a second shot. So that's why we teach our kids to obey, so that when they're adults and God gives them something that they ought to obey, they hear it, they listen to it, and they're willing to submit to it and do it immediately, do it completely, and do it with a good attitude. By the way, we, we know the passage where Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. You, let me ask you this morning, do you know the difference between the Lord's uh, voice and bad burritos? Do you know the difference between the Lord's voice and the voice of your mama? Do you know the difference between the Lord's voice and the voice of your wife or your husband? We ought to know the difference between his voice and the voice of anything else. We ought to know his difference between his voice and our emotions. Oftentimes people will say, God told me to do this. I feel this on my heart that God is leading me in this direction. But the problem usually is that when people say that, unfortunately so many times, the thing that they're about to say God led them to do is exactly contrary to what God tells us to do in the Bible. And God is never going to tell you to do something that he hasn't already told you to do in his word. Never. I know a pastor in New York who told me that God told him to leave his wife and his children for a woman that he was counseling. We can say, without any sort of difference of equation there, God did not say that. That's not what God said. God would never say something that contradicts his word. I had a friend in college that told me that God told him to marry his wife against her parents' permission. God wouldn't say that. That's not how God has designed marriage to work. God did not tell him to do that. And we can go on and on. I'm sure probably several examples have popped into your own head as well of things that people have told you. God told me to do this. And then we watch them go and carry that out and it only wrought destruction in their life because God didn't tell them to do that. 
It was their own emotions, most likely, that told them to do that. It was what they wanted to do that told them to do that. So if you're going to try to discern what God is saying or not saying, you should know his word. But if you don't know his word that well to know the difference, you should at least be willing to take that thing that you say, this is God's will for my life, and then compare it to scripture and make sure it matches up. Because God is never going to tell you something that won't match up with his word. And that's one of the devil's favorite tricks is to use a half-truth to convince you that something that is your own idea, that's your own emotional assent, is God's idea. He did it in the garden. He said to Eve, hath God not said? And then went to twist God's word and twist the scripture and tried to convince Eve of something that God hath not said. And in our, our, our world, there are so many different people who use an eighth of a Bible verse, a quarter of a Bible verse, completely out of context, not the way that God ever intended it to be used. And people convince themselves, well, This is what the Bible says, but that's not what the Bible says. That's not what God says. That's not what you ought to learn or ought to know. So do you know his voice? When he talks, do you obey immediately? Do you obey completely? Again, this is an area where we we justify. Boy, we're good at justifying in a horrible way, if I could say it that way this morning. We're good at justifying things that we ought not justify, We try to appease our conscience and we'll say, well, you know, God told me to fill in the blank and it's something that God actually told you to do. But then instead of doing it all the way and completely, you stop halfway. And I'm going to use an illustration that came to my mind. I do not know if this has occurred. So if this has occurred and you fall into this category, please do not take offense. Normally I am far more cautious, but I really think this suits and you'll understand it. So let's say... Pastor Davis had the mowing list out, right? And he said, you know, we need people to sign up to mow. And you signed up to mow. And let's say you you made that a priority. It was precious to you. I said I was going to do something. I'm going to do it. So you sign up to mow. You're on the mowing list. It's your day to mow. You show up to the church and you start mowing. Okay? And the lawnmower breaks. But you've only done half the lawn. Did you finish the job? No. Did you say you were going to mow the lawn? Yes. Could you say this is a valid reason to not finish the lawn? You absolutely could. But if God put it on your heart to sign up on the list, if God put it on your heart to mow the lawn, why not just figure out another way to mow the lawn? Oftentimes, it's just because we're too lazy. It really is. There are a million different ways that we could finish accomplishing whatever that thing is in our life. And that's just a really silly illustration there a little bit. But there are so many other things that we say, God put on my heart to do this. And we're even willing to set aside the time to do this. And we're willing to, to execute on doing this. But then halfway through, the devil just throws a little bit at us. Just a little bit. The blade's bent. Whatever that thing is, just a little thing at us, and we just crumble. We crumble and we forget. We crumble and we don't do it completely. We crumble and we don't even do it halfway. Sometimes the devil throws something at us right in the beginning and we don't even start doing that thing that we said we would do for God. We justify it. We only do half of what God said. If God puts something on your heart, do it and do it all the way. You know, another area that this could be, and this is something that that Pastor Davis and I fight with and our teachers fight with, is, is, you know, God put it on our heart to be teachers. God put it on our heart to study, to to do this job. But boy, howdy, doesn't the devil love to do anything he can to get in the way of our sermon prep? And it's too easy um, to to say, I'm too busy to study. I'm too busy. But if you said you were going to do something, you've got to do it all the way. You've got to put the time into the study. You don't just... Do half prep and then wing it. If it's God's will for you to do, it's God's will for you to do it immediately. It's God's will for you to do it all the way. Don't let the devil make you quit. One of the biggest things when I think about quitting that comes to my mind, and this is a a challenge that kind of is always in front of me, I can give you a list of names of men and women, twice my age, three times my age, half my age, (laughs) my age, (laughs) that are in the ministry and they've quit. Or even worse than quit, they've gotten themselves a DQ. They've gotten disqualified. When we think about something that God's put on your heart, listen, if God put a ministry on your heart, if God put for you to serve him on your heart, chances are he didn't put that on your heart for for just to start, just to do a little bit. He put that on your heart to finish. And as we consider being Christians, we were told when we talked about walking worthy of our call. Walking worthy of our call. That's not something that you just quit. That's not something that it gets hard so you stop. We have got to do these things to completion. Don't quit because it hurts. Don't quit because you don't feel like it anymore. 
as Christians, and this is so very important in our day and age, I really hope this, this comes through to you. We don't get to rest. You know, we have this concept in our society of retirement, right? I reach whatever magic age that is. It's not even on my, on my scale. I reach whatever magic age that is, and I get to sit down and rest. The same thing with the competition. You've won the race. You've won the competition. Now it's time to recover. But in the Christian life, the time to recover is in heaven. It's not here on earth. We have got to dedicate ourselves to running this Christian race. We've got to do it, and we've got to understand, hey, you know what? My break's in heaven. I've got work to do. I'm going to keep working until I get there. We can't stop. We can't stop. Your attitude of obedience. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, it says this, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he, hath, as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And pastor, I'm not going to steal these verses from you, but I do want to talk about the attitude that's conveyed in these verses. So very important, because pastor's talking about stewardship on Sunday morning. Those seem likely verses he may talk about. Um, can we even call it obedience? And I want you to ask yourself this question. Again, imagine that you're the, the supervisor or you're dealing with your children. Can you even call it obedience if though they do it on the outside, their heart is set against you? They don't want to do it. They're doing it grudgingly. They're doing it grudgingly. They're doing it. They're trudging through it. But they don't want to be there. They don't want to do that. Is that obedience? I guess. If they're doing it because they have to do it, so many people wake up and go to work because they have to. And yes, they're going to work. So many people come to church on Sunday morning because they have to. And we're glad you're here. Well, let's take it to the next level. Let's do something with that. Now you're here. Let's do something. If God wanted to make us do anything, he could make us do anything he wanted to do. It, it really is not even a relevant idea. God is not, does not want us to do things because he makes us to do them. God wants us to do things because we love him and we want to serve him. And I think this last Sunday, Pastor Davis said, God doesn't need your time. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your ability. And I'm glad because I don't have much of any of those things. But here's what God does want. And this is so very important because we're going to develop this idea as we keep working through this text. God does want your heart. God wants you to want to. We've talked about this before, but I think it's relevant here. There are many motivations for obedience. Sometimes my kids obey me because they're afraid of me. I'm bigger than them. I'm stronger than them. I have an American-made leather belt that helps them to understand why they should obey me sometimes, and that's fair. But listen, in the Christian life, sometimes we have people that show up and they obey God because they're afraid of being punished. They obey God because they know that if they're actually a child of God, he will chasten them. And does that produce obedience? It absolutely does produce obedience, but that's the lowest level of obedience we could hope for, doing something out of fear, doing something out of fear of punishment. Sometimes... My sons obey me because they want a reward. We have an established chore system. And sometimes there's nothing they want. So they don't want to do their chores. So they have no motivation. But other times there's something that they do want. And they'll work hard. And they may even try to get some extra chores so they can make that money to accomplish that thing that they want. Some people this morning under the sound of my voice are only here for what they can get out of it. And unfortunately some people are here for what they can get out of it here on this earth. For the vainglory and the praise of men. Other people are here with a, a right idea that they know if they serve and they serve correctly and they serve with the right heart that they will have a reward in heaven. But again, that's still a lower level motivation. And lastly, sometime, sometimes uh, my sons, and I say my sons because little Maddie's not quite old enough yet to really quite understand these concepts, though she does try to do things to make daddy happy. Um, sometimes for whatever reason, they'll have something in their heart and they'll want to express that they love me. They'll want to express that they're happy that I'm their dad. So without me telling them to do something, they'll go and do it with that motivation in mind. And, and then, of course, they'll come get me to show me what they've done so that they can see that I did it, which, again, is, is, is fair. Um, but that's the best motivation that we can have. There are some under my voice who get it. When I talked about propitiation, when I talked about what Jesus did for you, 
about the pain that he took for you. And again, we're not necessarily talking about the physical pain of the cross, though that is a lot. We're talking about the separation that he felt from God. We're talking about when God poured out the wrath that all of us deserve, that eternal wrath that all of us deserve, he poured it out on him. And he took that for us. If that doesn't cause love, I don't know what will. There are some who reacted the same way I did. And you don't know, when we talk about that propitiation, when we really try to put ourselves in that understanding, you don't know whether you should jump for joy or run in a corner and cry. Because it's so amazing what he did. John says, you want to know if you're saved or not? Are his commandments precious to you? Because by keeping them, by obeying the right way, completely with a joyful heart, you can show him your gratitude. Or are his commandments grievous to you? Are they a burden to you? You see why John says the person that doesn't keep his commandments is a liar? This is so important for us. This is not about external obedience. This is not about a checklist. This is not about what you look like on the outside. John's talking about something far bigger here. John's talking about keeping, about loving, about his commandments being precious to you. And that's far more than just someone who has an external, external checklist of things that they do. Who you are determines what you do. If you're, if you're one, one of his, his that will determine what you do. Anyone, anyone can have religion on the outside. outside. Anyone can keep a checklist. Anyone, anyone can pretend and obey on the outside. That's, That's why John's not suggesting you answer this question about another person. John is telling you how you can know that you are saved. How you can know where you stand with God. I always love the text in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. How many of us do that? We look on people's countenances. We look to see what they look like. Are they happy? Are they sad? For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Listen, you know who you are this morning, whether you're one of his or not. And though you may have fooled the rest of us, you know that you can't fool God. Let's move on in our text. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But he so, whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby we know that we are in him. And he saith, he abiding in him ought also so to walk, even as he walked. Whoso keepeth his word, verily is the love of God perfected in him. That's what this whole thing has been about. It's been about understanding God's love. It's been about, and we're going to deepen this thought again as we continue in this, but it's about love. It's about understanding God's love and then being able to show that love. And the idea of perfecting that love is when we get saved, we have just a little bit of understanding of that love. And as we grow and we continue in that, the more we understand about that love, the more our understanding of that love is perfected. Okay? So hereby is the love of God perfected by us understanding these things. It's not by the external keeping of these commandments, but it's about those commandments being precious to us in our heart. It's about them changing us on the inside, and that's how we grow in this love. Then John says um, an idea which he discussed very deeply in his, his gospel, and we'll read those verses in his gospel. He says that, so that's John 15, if you want to turn there. He says that he that abideth in him ought also to walk, even as he walked. The idea of abiding in Christ is such, a, such an awesome idea. Uh, let's jump there to John 15. And we're actually going to read the first 14 verses um, and see what John had to say in the gospel about abiding in him. John 15, 1 says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Just chew on that alone for a few minutes. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. And as the Father hath loved me, 
so have I loved you. Continue in my love. We're starting to see some words that are similar, some ideas that are similar here. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I feel like we're just reading, essentially, John all over again in these words that he's saying here with this a little bit of a different understanding to them. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And here this is Jesus talking, not John. Even when Jesus walked on the earth, there were false vines. And it's so very important for us to even con- for us to consider that idea that there is a false vine. There are things that men and women, and even other teachers that men and women want to plug themselves into and get power from in order to live their daily lives. And this happened in Jesus' day and age. While Jesus was there, there were imitators of him. There were people that people wanted to follow, that people wanted to get life from. But we talked about how John said that there was something different about Jesus. That all these other people were wandering around pretending to be Jesus. But this guy had life. He had life. Jesus is the true vine. He's the true source of life. And God is the husband then. The one who is taking care of the vine. There's so much truth in these verses. And we will not get to it all today. Um, but verse 4. A, f- a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So many who claim that they're in the vine. Take credit for their own fruit. And sometimes it's just a semantic of words. And they don't really understand what they're saying. And we've got to be careful with that. But so many will, will claim. I got someone saved. Or I did this. Or I did that. Or I, I, I. The only reason I can do anything is because Jesus did it through me. Because I'm plugged into the vine. How misguided. There's nothing productive we can do to advance the kingdom if we're not plugged into the source of life. If we're not in the vine. We can work on our own and we'll produce wood, hay, and stubble. If you don't abide in him, then you're a stick which will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And there's so much overlap. Um, So many people today want to talk about love, love, love. Jesus is all love. Love, love, love. The problem is like we talked about before with these false teachers. Their love doesn't produce anything. Just like when these false teachers talk about salvation, they talk about how they have salvation, they understand salvation. Their salvation is a false profession because they don't know who Jesus is. They've created their own vocabulary in their own mind. They've created their own terms for salvation in their own mind. And it's the same way with the word love. They'll say that they have love, but they don't have love because they've created their own idea of what love is. You don't love unless you obey. And that obedience produces fruit. But if you don't obey... And you don't have love. And you don't produce fruit. And you're not in the vine. And if you're not in the vine, then your professional faith is, faith is false. And you'll be cut down and cast into the fire. Jesus, just like John, doesn't pull punches in this statement. Jesus doesn't say, well, if they, if they abide in the vine for a little bit. He doesn't give that as an option that you can be in the vine and then not in the vine. He says you either are in the vine or you're not in the vine. Stop playing games. Jesus says, if you abide in me, then I abide in you. He doesn't say, if you abide in me for three minutes, then I'll abide in you for three minutes, and then you can go do what you want for three minutes. That's not how he presents the option here. It's a do or or not do. If you're in the vine, something will happen. If you're in the vine, then you'll produce the same thing as the vine. If you're not producing the same thing as the vine, then you're not in the vine. So just like John said, make sure you're in the vine, and we've talked about salvation, and making sure you're saved. And yet again, John circles back to it, or continues that theme. And I wish to, to consider in the last minute or so we have, we'll cut last couple of minutes, uh, an, an idea. I'll just, I'll just throw this at you and let you chew on it till next week. Um, I think there's a, an unspoken doctrine in churches across America, an unspoken teaching or idea that rattles around in people's heads that salvation is for beginners. Salvation is for you know, people that are new Salvation is just this thing that we start in, but then we continue on to something else. I think salvation is so very critical. I think that it's something that we walk in, that we learn to understand, and that it's not really something that we can just set aside and say, oh, that's for the new kids. I don't need to hear that anymore. I don't need to understand that anymore. 
Paul uh, said when he went to the Corinthians, he said, And brethren, I came to you not with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I think that the idea um, that the gospel is just a starting point is, is just doesn't work. And some of you have been here for uh, Sunday afternoon. Some of you have not been here for Sunday afternoon when pastors talked about the other doctrines and the doctrine of soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And I certainly would not dare to say that I understand any of, any of those doctrines which are justification, repentance, sanctification, adoption, or prayer to their completeness. I, I wouldn't say that. And I don't think anybody else could say that in this room. I don't think we'd go, oh, I got that. I really got that. Those are things that we can study every day, that we can continue in every day, that we can learn more about every day. So please, when you consider salvation, don't just go, oh, he's talking about salvation again and put it on a shelf. Because salvation is so very important. There are so many things that we need to understand about salvation. I'm jumping straight to my conclusion. Uh, Let's just close in prayer. Because the conclusion doesn't work without the information of the previous three pages. Gracious Heavenly Father God, Lord, we just love you so much. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for for the burden that John had to communicate these things to us, to give us these things that we can examine in our own life and see if we're in the faith, to give us these these ideas about following his commandments, about being in him, about walking in love. Father, please help us this morning to understand these things. Please help us to grow in these things. And we pray. Amen.